Hi, welcome to Conversations with Hannah. Today I am at uh, the lovely town hall outside on a gorgeous day and I'm joined here by Sandy Wright, our town clerk, to talk a little bit about the expanded voting options uh, that people have uh, this fall. Um, as you know, Sandy, very well, <laughs> the legislature at the end of June uh, passed a bill that expanded voting options. Um, you know, our concern was with the pandemic and thinking there was a second wave uh, potentially coming this fall, making sure that people had more choices on how to safely vote uh, in both the primary and uh, the presidential election in November. And that, uh, I think it was a good law, I voted for it. Uh, it meant a lot more work for you and your team here in the town clerk's office. And um, in addition to wanting to recognize all the great work that you've been doing, I um, also wanted to talk to you about uh, what people's options were to vote and to make sure that you know, everyone in Shrewsbury is aware of the many different ways in which they can participate in the upcoming November election. Um, and I really think that you got a, uh, a very good dry run with the primary uh, to sort of understand how things were going to go. Your, you and your team did a remarkable job. So much work behind the scenes and I, I want to make sure people first and foremost understand the amount of work that your office um, and all the, the people that work with you and you yourself have to do in order to successfully pull off uh, the election. So talk a little bit about uh, what went into first getting ready to have the primary. Well, I guess the initial thing was setting up the precincts. Everything had to be safe for the public. Each precinct received a box of masks, gloves, hand sanitizer sprays, paper towels. Before entering a precinct, a voter would have required to wear a mask and they would be uh, masks for those who did not have one. Uh, only five voters were allowed in the precinct at a time. There were six foot marking distances between the voters and the voting booths themselves were marked off. They were using every other voting booth. The person that would check in their name and they'd receive a ballot and a marking pen. After they go, went and voted, they went back to the checkout table to deposit their ballot and they would also deposit their ink pen, which again would be in a box, get sanitized. sanitized. After any voter left a booth, the clerks were told to go sanitize each booth. Um, periodically, the clerks would go around and wipe down the booths, the pens, uh, the bathrooms were only available to poll workers. No one could use bathrooms or uh, lunch rooms or anything. When the poll workers returned to town hall, they usually come in my office. But for the primary, we had them just come into the hall and uh, we'd collect their items there and then just have them leave if everything was in order. Um, and just everything was set up, distance, uh, social distancing apart. So it seemed to work out fine. The, the voters loved it. The precinct workers loved it. It all ran pretty smooth. But again, we didn't, we had a 70% turnout by mail for the primary. Only 30% went to the polls. So the polls were fairly quiet. So talk to us about what it means when people um, right now want to vote by mail. So, you know, traditionally people have had the ability to do an absentee ballot. They would apply to either in person or through the mail to get one from your office and get it returned to them. But they had to be for a reason. Correct. It just simply wasn't out of convenience. It had to be um, either, you know, some, some medical issue, illness or work related that Correct. you were not going to be here on the day of the election. Uh, part of the law that we expanded made it essentially a, a no reason uh, to want to vote by mail. So tell us about that process. And, you know, one of the things that people probably saw, um, should have everyone who's a registered voter would have seen, is an application in the mail. Um, and they would have gotten this actually twice, once before the primary in order to apply. And then again, uh, it, it was already out uh, for the general election. So what does that mean? Somebody gets this, then what happens? Well, on the first one that went out, it had two boxes. Uh, you could check off just for the primary, just for November, or both. For both, yep. The majority checked off both. The state sent out the second round that went out was only supposed to go to voters who did not check off the November. But a lot of people are, we're getting tons of duplicates. They're resending them, I guess, just to make sure. So well, they, they send that to us. We put them in, in, in the computer, log them in. 
uh, once we get the ballots, we're going to be packaging them out. We won't get them probably till October 5th, usually four to five weeks before an election, we get all the ballots. As Soon as we get them, we start packaging them out. Then we'll mark in the computer that they've gone out to that person. If they vote and receive it, it gets marked that they've received it, that we've received it. That was another question about people uh, that requested an absentee ballot and then showed up at the polls. Well, if they showed up the polls, there is already a notation beside their name that they applied for an absentee ballot. The poll worker would in, in turn go to the warden and ask her, you know, to confirm this. The warden would call my office. If I had not received that back, that person would be able to vote in person by filling out a form. If I had already received it back, I'd say, no, we've got their ballot. It's, it's done. They cannot vote. And that happened as well with the expanded um, voting in person. So people um, could have received their ballot and mailed that back in. They could have also dropped it off um, at uh, your office. Yes. Um, and I understand that in the upcoming election, there's going to be another. Um... I ordered a, a ballot box similar to the regular postal mailbox. And it looks like they were putting, setting something up down there for a foundation to a block to set it on. So hopefully we should be getting that soon. And that's going to be, uh, yes, for all ballot boxes only. Great. And so people will know that they can drop their ballot securely off there. But people also had um, the opportunity to vote ahead of time um, on, in an expanded number of hours that we haven't seen before in a primary. And so um, two of my uh, daughters voted that way, uh, came up to town hall, uh, and they were in and out super quick. Uh, very easy process. But sort of explain if somebody wants to come in and vote early in person, uh, yeah. what that looks like. OK, early voting schedule, the state is requiring us to do it for two weeks. And it'll include weekends. It's going to begin October 17th, and it's going to go through October 30. So October 17 and 18 is a Saturday and Sunday. We'll be open from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. for early voting. Uh, the week of October 19 to 23 is just Monday through Friday, so it'll be our regular office hours. You can early vote from 8 to 4.30. October 24 is a Saturday. It's also the last day to register to vote. We will be open from 2 p.m until 7 p.m. so you can register to vote or early vote. And uh, the 25th is a Sunday. We'll be open 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. Then the last week, October 26th through the 30th, we'll be here from 8 a.m. to 4.30. Now the building is still closed to the public, so all this early, that's the only w reason it's open for is early voting. No other business can take place. Yep, and so people will simply walk in. Um, they will actually go right by your town clerk's window yes. um, and they would line up and you have it marked on the floor um, and they'd go into the old selectman's room um, and then they're checking in electronically, correct? Yes, we have poll pads we've checked which we used uh, the last two times yep. and we actually it was approved at town meeting to order them for all the elections so next year we will be using those at the polls but this year we're going to we have two more so we will have four for early voting. And as I said, it was very easy. Uh, the, the girls were in and out of here uh, very quickly to come in and vote in person early. And, and that was a great option. Uh, at the time, neither um, one was aware she'd be at college and so came up like on the first day of early voting to vote in the primary. The other one thought she would be home and then her schedule changed uh, and realized that before she left, you know, she needed to run up and vote. So both were great options. It, did, it ran pretty smooth. Like I said, we had, uh, what did I already mention, we had 7,500 that came to the vote early at, right at town. No, that was by mail, excuse me, by mail. 500 came to vote early. And then the remainder, 1,800, went to the polls. And uh, that was a record turnout for a primary in Massachusetts. I, I'm not sure it was a record turnout, but it was a... Uh, I think was since it, 1990, right. maybe, it was a... Uh, Actually, that's uh, right. I did send some statistics out. Yeah, we don't usually get big turnouts for primaries. This election, we already have probably 11,000 applications for ballots by mail. And how many voters, registered voters do we have in Sandy? Approximately 24,000. And uh, we're expecting to see uh, in total voting for the presidential election. 
Well, in, in 2016, we had an 81% turnout. I, I think this one's probably going to be higher. It'll probably be in the 90s. And that has happened before. And one thing that the voters who did vote in person when they went to vote um, noticed that they're, uh, unlike in past elections where you would both check in and check out, one of the provisions in the law that we passed uh, enabled us not to have a checkout uh, person. And, and again, part of that was a concern for making sure we had enough poll workers. Uh, again, being unaware of what uh, the situation on the ground would look like in November relative to the pandemic. And certainly, um, you know, many of our, our poll workers in past years have been people who have retired uh, and want to give, but they also may be in a higher risk group. And so out of concern and caution, uh, that was. We did go with a few, uh, at least one extra poll, poll worker in each, one less poll worker in each precinct. Yeah. And that law for the checkout is just a temporary till the end of this year. Yeah, yeah there were a few temporary changes just for this year. The voter registration deadline is usually 20 days before an election. This year, it's 10 days before the election. And I also believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the, there is a change in terms of when you can apply for an absentee ballot. Is that correct? I think it used to be where you can uh, up until like the, the day before at noon. I, I believe it's now Friday. Yes. So that and part of that was to give more time it's knowing. just for the mailed ones. OK. There's been a permanent change. One being the deadline to request an absentee ballot by mail is now four day business days before an election. It used to be right up till noon the day before. So now it's the fourth business day before. But absentee ballot request in person to vote in person is still the same. Okay. You can do that up till noon the day before the election. And if somebody uh, is voting by mail, uh, their ballot, it, it must be postmarked by 5 p.m. on November 3rd, election day. Correct. But it can be received up until November 6th, I believe, at 5 p.m. November 6th, 5 p.m., exactly. And that's probably because all the slowdown in the post office, people receiving mail at a slower rate. Right, absolutely. And again, you know, an unknowing of what the pandemic would look like uh, in November and not knowing what the impact would be on the postal system. Uh, it was a precautionary move. We didn't seem to have any problem in Shrewsbury, but I know other cities and towns did. That's great. Um, and then, Sandy, on the ballot, um, people will be coming in and, and sometimes there are local questions and, and there are two local questions. And sometimes that means people get handed two ballots, either a state or presidential ballot and a local ballot. This year we do have two questions, but it's all on one ballot. So um, they'll, people will be uh, responding to be asked if they want to vote on four questions. Two are statewide, question one and question two. Uh, question one has to deal with the right to repair and question two has to deal with ranked choice voting. Yeah. Um, and then question three locally is the question about uh, building a new police station and funding a new emergency communication system. Right. And question four, I believe, is the CPA ballot question. Right. And it is all on one ballot. Yeah, which will be a change. If you voted in 2018 at the presidential, you You're got right. two ballots if you uh, requested one to vote on the Beal uh, question. Kevin had asked me that and I called the state and they just informed me it would all be on one. That's great. Any other sort of, um, again, I want to stress uh, gratitude for oh, you and your office. I, you know, I know the statistics, but why don't you share how much work has gone into? Well, it's a huge amount of work. We did get some phenomenal help. The packaging was the, was a tough part doing thousands and thousands, especially for the primary because you're packaging different ballots, Democrat, Republican, yeah. Green, Rainbow, so you had to be aware of when you're packaging it, that you're putting the right ballot in the right envelope. Um, we did have some great people working, though, so that helps. The other thing is all those applications you got, what we have to do is um, we have to input them into the system individually, each one. And then we have to we sort them by precinct into a box. And then as we go into the computer and mail them, We'd, be, we'd mark them that they've been mailed and it gets marked in the computer. All the ballots, once we send the ballots out, they all come back to us and we have to do the same thing. We have to put them by precinct in order because they're going to go out to the polls. We don't process them here. Everything gets processed election day at the polls. So we deliver each precinct thousands of ballots. We put them in precinct order, in street order, 
alphabetically. And again, you're talking, you know, thousands and thousands. And then they go to the polls. We have our voter list set up so that when the poll workers receive it, everyone, there is a notation. If anyone applied for an absent voter or an early voting ballot, there is a notation beside their name. And that's the process they use when they, it, unless there's an X already in there. See, we print the voter list. We try to do it as close to the election as we can, but it's so long, the voter list, for the primary, we did it on a, I believe, a Saturday. Yeah. And so Sunday and Monday, ballot uh, requests are still coming into us. So what we're given the poll workers is everything with, that was processed up to that date. Yeah. It'll have whether they voted, everything's checked. But after that, it's not gonna be on their voter list. So we start writing lists that we give to them with the ballots. This person, you know, these are the extra ballots that came in after the voter was printed. Am I too confusing? No, you know what? It's an absolutely astounding amount of work. And I think, again, you know, you and your staff, you've been in here, you know, seven days a week straight for months, uh, for weeks on end, getting ready for the primary and now for the general election. And I really want to make sure that yeah, people there, understand. There is a huge amount. This is, since I've been here in 33 years, this is the first election that this and this primary busier than I've ever seen since I've been here. And it's because of the early voting and the COVID. Well, I want to thank you and your team for all of the work. And really, you know, there's a such a high degree of confidence um, in Shrewsbury in terms of our, our voting process. And um, a lot of that is goes straight to the fact that you guys do such an amazing amount of work. And, you know, the, the poll workers, again, are volunteers who are coming in. Um, and uh, I really want to commend them, not just for this year, but for all the years that they uh, choose to participate in our democracy like that, making sure that we can pull it off. Um, well, thank you so much. And I do have to say, um, my staff has been phenomenal. I, I wouldn't get by this without them. I hope you all have a big uh, event evening well, we're together plan, doing yeah, something, we're even if it's something. on Zoom with a glass of But um, as a reminder to people too, again, you know, this is a really good, uh, uh, helpful piece of information to have ahead of elections. It has not only uh, information in there on the two statewide questions, but it does also include all of the different ways that you can participate in voting. It has an absentee, uh, uh, it has a, a voter registration form uh, inside of it. It tells you how you can track your ballot if you're voting by mail. Um, and I would like to tell people though, before they send that in, to just call us and check, because a lot of people are sending them in, they're already in there. So that we still have to go through the whole process of sending them a, a letter saying this is a duplicate, da 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 da. So if they just called us before they send it in, that would make a huge difference too. That's a great, good suggestion. And, and your office is also not just working on uh, voting issues. You're still, oh, no, we're still open. Doing. I know that you have a way to set up um, a time to come in and uh, a, a dedicated time. So again, from a COVID precaution, right. uh, an appointment. It's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And we have people Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from nine to three appointments. It hasn't stopped. Actually, most of the office are on reduced staff, but he, the town manager gave us permission to have the whole staff back because it was just getting too overwhelming. Well, thank you, Sandy. And thank you. And we appreciate the work you do. Well, you know what? It, it's a great town, and I think that we all take very seriously uh, the responsibility that we have uh, to be part of um, the, the community effort to preserve our democracy and to make sure that people are aware of the options open to them. So uh, thank you to you and your team, and uh, we will. I'll be by uh, as usual uh, to say hello on election day a ritual um, and to thank folks. But uh, we're looking forward to uh, an election which we may or may not know all the results of on November 3rd definitively. Uh, so people please have patience. Uh, it is not an issue of uh, lack of hard work here on this end. There's a volume uh, question to it all as well. So thank you, Sandy. Thank you. So I'm here this afternoon on the town hall lawn. Uh, we just spoke with Sandy um, from the town clerk's office, Andy Wright, who sort of gave an overview of the expanding voting options uh, coming up before the presidential election. Um, and we touched on quickly at the end uh, that the fact that there's two local questions that are going to be on the presidential ballot. And one of them is uh, regarding uh, the question of whether or not we as a community uh, want to replace our uh, police station uh, and to uh, put into place a new emergency communication system. So I'm 
uh, here on the lawn <laughs> with uh, two people who know uh, this issue very well. Uh, a recently retired uh, Sergeant Chuck Pratt, uh, Thanks for having 33 me. years uh, with the Shrewsbury Police Department. And how long ago was I at your retirement party? A year and a half ago? Actually, no, just a year. Just a year, a year last week. So just a year ago, we enjoyed your retirement party, uh, Dave Hodgeny, who was 32 years as a Shrewsbury firefighter. So I was joking earlier, there's a combined 55 years between the two of you uh, of service to this community on the public safety, which is absolutely phenomenal. And so first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for having um, us today. And uh, the three of us are, are sharing some time together today to not only talk about uh, this question that's before us, uh, but we're also working to actively support it. Uh, we are part of the community supporters uh, for public safety. Uh, Michael Hale, a former, just recently retired, I'm surrounded by retired people, <laughs> uh, general manager of Selco, uh, is chairing our uh, committee. And we're really focused on making sure that the public is aware of the question and what it means. Um, and we wanted to talk a little bit today uh, about the, your experiences, uh, both as a police officer and as a firefighter. And um, Chuck, you just retired uh, very recently. Yes. And I have a smile. yes, you said <laughs> your, your smile comes through even when you have a mask on. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but you have a, a long career here and have really um, understood uh, the building deficiencies, um, but also as that relates to the changing in policing. Uh, certainly when this building was built in 1971, it was built with a, a mindset of what policing looked like, as well as uh, being really built just for the moment in time. So it didn't envision you know, a tremendous amount of growth in our community, which we've certainly seen over the years. Talk a little bit about, as somebody who has been in that building for a very long time, what are some of the things that you as a police officer in the, in the, um, with policing changes really notice about the limitations of the building? Well, I was here for the, they did a renovation once. Yes. And literally almost immediately in certain spots, we had outgrown the building. Uh, one in particular is they had, uh, for wellness, they were gonna have a gym area. And almost immediately, evidence took that over and evidence has become and changed because of the laws, retention and everything, we have to hold on to it so much longer. So just with mere evidence, we outgrew the station almost immediately. So to me, that was amazing to see. And over the years with the officers and the amount of officers coming on the job, and you know, being next to Worcester, the second largest community in Massachusetts, you know, it keeps this town busy, the traffic, the activity and everything else. So I've just seen a, a, an extreme growth in, in both the amount of officers and the activity that we're, we're up to and what we're dealing with. And one of the things I know from having visited the police station um, at various times, uh, having toured it as a finance committee member, but also having visited to, to sometimes meet uh, and talk to uh, police officers about some of pending legislation and getting input, um, and also just coming as a resident who may have needed a service. The lobby is extremely small. Um, you walk in and the dispatchers are the ones, and they're already incredibly busy. And I know a bit about the dispatching because my brother uh, served as a dispatcher for uh, a period of time. Uh, and greatly enjoyed you and your sense of humor uh, when he was in that role. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but um, you know, so people walking in, they're not walking in and greeted by anyone who can immediately respond. You know, the dispatchers need to do their very critical role of answering the, the calls and, and sending out information. Um, and there's no privacy in that area. So I know that one of the things that occurs is you have, um, you know, that's where we do prisoner release because it's under. Um, it's inside and we don't have any other area to do that. So you potentially have a lobby where you're releasing somebody. Uh, you also may have a grieving family member there who has just you know, lost a loved one in an accident and needs to come in. Uh, you may have something else uh, going on in terms of somebody who has a meeting in the building to talk to a detective about potentially you know, uh, uh, their house being broken into. So all of these things are happening in that very small area. Mm. Um, I, it just what I've noticed is I, I was the admin sergeant for the last 15 years for the previous chief. So I spent a lot of time in that station and also at times intermittently supervised the dispatch center. So let's talk about dispatch first. They're getting distracted away from 911, the phone calls and everything else that's going on this and the police officers on the radio with lobby traffic. Mm -hmm. So that creates less and in, in, in a, not a good service for our citizens because they're being taken away from citizens coming up to the glass. Now the citizens that come up to the glass, the dispatch glass, mm -hmm. have issues because what happens is they're not getting service right away and that's a source of a lot of complaints and, and also the privacy issues. Besides what you brought up, there's also victims of sexual assaults mm -hmm. that come in that lobby 
And you know, there's privacy issues there, and, right. and that's something that has to be separated. I, I um, there's also uh, a real lack of space to even meet with people in right. there. There's one conference room that you have um, on the floor, and you know, there are many times, again, we're a community of over 38,000 residents now. There's a volume of work to be done, and part of that is meeting with people. And so there's real limitations, I think. Right. Well, as, as you know, as part of my administrative job, I did the pistol permits for the town of Shrewsbury, mm -hmm. and I met with thousands of citizens. But I was in an actual, like, hallway area. It was a pass-through area. So I was continuously interrupted. We made it work. But also, that was the interview room for people that came into the lobby. So what would happen is people would come into the lobby, I'd be doing pistol permits, we'd have to take them to the roll call room where all the officers are. The, the privacy issue once just expanded in just a simple situation like that. And, and you brought up the conference room. We have one conference room. The command staff now at its size can't sit in there as a whole. So the chief can't have a command staff meeting. That's, to me, outrageous. You right. have to have a room where you can hold your entire command staff and communicate what's going to go to the troops and the other police officers. And you touched on it a few minutes ago. I mean, again, another one of the things in 1971 that was never envisioned, uh, or even in 1996, I would say, is um, the, the traffic in our community and the fact that we now need to think through, and, and the new building has space for this in the future, whether or not we need a traffic division who's really out there devoted to you know, making sure, again, we have a busy Route 20, we have a busy Route 9, we have a very busy town center. I mean, there are a number of places in our community where you know, we need to have folks who are out there and, and it can't be, they can do traffic as long as they're not at another important call. Right. Um, and so again, this building uh, allows for that, you know, thinking about what is, um, what do we need to look like in the future? Um, there, there isn't a spot for a traffic division, period. There isn't anything there. That'd be great. And, and, and why I think it's important, the number one complaint that the chief lieutenants that we got, especially when I was in charge of the patrol division, was traffic complaints. Mm -hmm. As much as people don't like getting speeding tickets, right. they want radar and traffic enforcement throughout the entire town. So that that's important to address that, and that'll help satisfy the community response. You know, the community's questions to that. Also, the transient traffic. Shrewsbury itself is a relatively small town, thirty-five thousand, maybe more. I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure. But the transient traffic from Worcester, Framingham, Marlborough, all that's coming through for employment purposes is huge. Yeah. So during the day and evening, you know, it it's, it's increases eight tenfold the population, and it's mainly traffic. One of the other changes that we've talked about, and uh, you know, the, the chief, new chief uh, Kevin Anderson did a great video, which I would encourage people to watch internally, uh, produced by Shrewsbury Media Connection, of the building and the limitations, because certainly um, we can't give open tours of the police station, uh, not only from the pandemic point of view, but from a, a safety point of view in terms of having people inside a police station and, and moving around. Uh, but we wanted to really give uh, an inside uh, perspective of what are the challenges, and, and he did a great job talking through that. One of the things, and you and I have talked about this, um, the changing in policing, it's not just in terms of procedure and policy, and um, it's also in uh, who is joining forces and, and wanting to serve as a police officer. And when this building was built, uh, it has a, a locker room, which is um, certainly uh, not large enough for the existing force anyways, but it also has a very tiny women's locker room. And so I think, you know, you and I talked about uh, this new building, again, will have locker room facilities that are for, um, you know, a, a, a room enough, not only for today, but in terms of uh, growth, but also for women as well. Um, the, the faces in policing are changing, and society is, society is, is asking for more female officers, and, and that's going to happen, and we don't have a facility that can, that can take care of that right now. That's part of this also. As somebody who has a daughter who's a first year studying criminal justice at Endicott College, I'm very happy to have. <laughs> Another thing too, and, and uh, Chief Anderson had brought this up, and I personally experienced this, there's one bathroom for the male officers and one for the female. Just think about that. There's right. almost 50 offices, if you include specials, at time during the day, in and out of the station. That, you know, I don't even want to go any further with that, but that's just something to think about. And the shower that's in there is inoperable, so we don't have a shower facility. And, you know, officers get involved and they're, they're getting, you know, at motor vehicle accidents or whatever. They might get exposed to, to mm -hmm. things or get dirty in a, in a chase, a foot chase through the woods or whatever it might be. And there's no ability to clean yourself up after. And I, I think that's something that should be addressed also. Yeah, it's a, a health issue in today and right. today's infectious disease and everything else. So the one other um, you know area that I think is important to touch on um, is the fact that um, 
you know, the you can't meet not only as the, the command level staff, you cannot have, you don't have enough room, especially with COVID going on, to meet uh, at uh, shift changes. And so you're meeting in the garage, yeah, which yeah. is when not, I left, yeah. when I left the police department, we were conducting roll call in the garage area with the doors open, which kind of uh, come winter, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen right. there. The, the, um, and, and additionally, something that you think is very important is training. Right. And right now, you know, we're unable to use this facility for any training. Policing in today's day and age is changing, let's face it. And, and society's making demands, which I agree with. Yeah. We have to move forward and to, to, to have a more professional police agency, to be trained properly in the use of force and, and, and also in the de-escalation process. That requires regular training, not an off-site building that we go to and try to get the date together and get it all going. It's very complicated and difficult. Even equipment-wise, to get the equipment there is hard to do, besides getting the personnel there. It has to be held within the station in a training facility. That's the best way to train our officers. Yeah, I think that's a really critical piece. And, um, you know, I'm very hopeful that folks will take advantage of every opportunity to sort of learn more about the police station aspect of the question that's going to be before us. But there's an important reason that we call ourselves Community Supporters for Public Safety. And that was in recognition of this is not just about a building. Um, it is also about our emergency communication system, which impacts certainly not only police, but fire uh, and Selco and DPW. And so, Dave, you know, this is something that you felt very passionate about uh, over the course of the last number of years. Uh, we're dealing with a system that's 25 years old. If you stop and think about um, 25 years ago, I mean, just look at your cell phone. You know, 25 years ago, not everyone even had a cell phone, but if they had it, it was as large as my purse is. A bag, yeah. bag phone. Right. Bag and phone. so yeah. that is the age of the technology yeah. that we're using right now. Right. We can't even um, fix it. They no longer manufacture parts. Right. Um, and you know, the only blessing we have sort of in this community relative to that is that we have two incredible individuals, uh, Joe Milish, who's a firefighter, and Dave Fosher, who's Dave a police Fosher, officer, yeah. um, who have done amazing work, not in their job description, to try and keep the system running. They work phenomenal together. Um, and, you know, absent that, you know, this is a very serious situation and a very critical component of the question before us uh, in November. So, Dave, talk a little bit about you know, your experiences as a firefighter and, and what having the system that we have here right now has meant. Well, over the course of my lifetime here, uh, it's, it's always been a problem, but you know, you always thought like, uh, they've always done things like to try to band-aid it, like, like to, we'll get, get something to try to make it a little bit better. But it, 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 what it all comes down to is the same thing, is it's just, it's static most of the time because we have a lot of brick buildings in town. And when we're, we go to those from, uh, you know, for, for alarms going off or something, when, once you get in the building, you can't even talk to each other. And in this day and age, because, you know, the, the fires and stuff that they have, they're not as like they used to have, but they still, you know, the guys, it's, it's a safety issue. You know, and I've been, I, I retired a year ago, and we had a meeting with the chief one day, and uh, I had said to him, he was talking about different things that he's doing for the fire department, which was phenomenal. And I said to him, I said, everything is phenomenal, but for one thing, we need a new radio system. And he says, I know, but it's, it costs money, and we can't just... You know, just get it. We it, that needs to be something we need to get together and, and try to get it done. Because I remember a couple of years ago, it was in New Hampshire, on the on the TV. Same thing happened to a town. It was a, a, a fire chief got on and said, "Listen, and they had to have it as a as a you know a, it, it, you know to vote on because the same thing. They, everybody's on the same frequency and stuff. And they did. It was passed there, and it and it, it made a big difference. So I mean, it's 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 up until the day I retired a year ago, I had said to the chief, I says, you know what's the sad thing is. And that's just how things happen sometimes. It's like almost like somebody has to die, seriously, for something to be changed. And I had said to the chief, I said, it's probably going to be me, the luck I have. I said, because we were going to, like I said, going to these buildings. There's a building, State Street Bank. You think you've probably been there before at the, yes. at the bottom of a... Uh, Very uh, secure. Very yes, secure. It's, it's unbelievable, this building. And you cannot talk at all. Somebody has to be outside. And even if somebody's outside, you know, we've gone there for like just, to, you know, for a... Uh, inspections and stuff, but if something ever really happened inside that building, where everybody in the building is like, you better be together because if you separate, you can't, no one's gonna know where anybody is. And you certainly touch on the reason why this question is before us as um, a debt exclusion, part of this public safety question. Uh, it's a $5 million investment. It is not a, a small uh, chunk of change. 
Um, it's a critical expenditure. But were we not to do it through a debt exclusion, it would be impossible for us to find $5 million in our operating budget to do this. The other reason it's uh, critical timing is that when this uh, radio system uh, goes in, you know, it has to be installed into a, a building and also uh, have a redundancy. The system would be installed into this new police station building. Uh, and, and we're building it with that in mind and also with the, the notion of moving to a central dispatch. Um, so not only you know is it makes sense to do this as a, as a debt exclusion, but you know clearly we know the need is there, and it makes perfect sense in terms of timing to move forward and do it. So we're doing this as the new building is being constructed, and then the redundant uh, end of it to make sure, God forbid, anything ever happened, you know, to a, a one building, right. you have it in another. You know, the fire station would have that second um, redundancy to it, and right. so um, you know you, you also touched on another critical element, which is. It's not just internal to buildings. I know where there's dead spots in town. You know, there are just some areas in town which you do not have the ability Dean to Park, communicate. Dean Park, for instance, if, if you're on your phone right now, if we were talking, you, I would lose you right now because it just, there's nothing down there that, you know, for the, uh, the phones, the towers or nothing, you know, it's just, it's sad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know that as a, a cell phone user yeah. because literally, uh, you know, if my husband's on the phone with me, he'll just say Dean Park and I'll know that I'm not going to hear him for 30 seconds as he passes by the, um, but, you know, tell us about some of the instances. I know from talking to um, Aaron Roy uh, that, you know, there have been times when he has been communicating to uh, firefighters going on a scene and, you know, he believes he's communicating, you know, he's speaking right. on the other end, all the firefighters are hearing is static. So you don't even necessarily know that what you're communicating is not being received. Well, a, a, an example is a cool at school, uh, just before I retired, we were doing an inspection and uh, the captain was probably about 35, 40 feet from me. And he was telling us all oh, we're to go inside the building where we're gonna do the inspection and you know do the uh, fire alarms. And I read his lips, but all I heard was <laughs> just static. And I'm like, he was, we were outside. We weren't even in the building yet. I'm like, so if this had been a major thing, well, what if the kids were in the building, it's full of smoke, and we need to talk to each other to get, get people out of the building? That would have been a, a, you know, a catastrophe. And it's that emergency situation too, where not only do you need to be able to talk you know, a, among firefighters, you also need to be able to communicate between police, fire, and right. other times, you know, Selco and DPW, depending on what the nature of the emergency is. Right. Certainly a, a natural disaster right. sort of, or large scale, you know, incident in our community, which requires multiple responses to, we don't have a system we can rely on that we know we can communicate. I mean, I personally think of a, a large scale incident was the ice storm. I believe it was a 2008, was it 2008? Oh, that, that, that involved every single agency in town yeah. and communication was awful. Yeah. And you, you end up resorting to your cell phones. That's, yeah. that's unacceptable. It certainly is. And, um, you know, as we move forward in our community too, I think, you know, communication is key. Um, and more and more, not only changes in policing, but, you know, the effort to keep a community safe is not just sort of dependent on, on police alone or fire alone. It's the, the ability to communicate between um, the groups and to make sure that um, you're backing each other up as needed. You know, you oftentimes, police uh, could potentially be first on scene, you know, and, and waiting for the fire department to come. And, and that ability to communicate is, is critical. Yep. Um, relay the important information to, the, to the other agency. That's the main thing is the important information because you know as a, as a, like a, a fire truck driving a fire truck they're, they're big trucks and to go to a scene we, we try to go you, the speed limit some, sometimes you have to go a little faster and it's nice to know if like a police officer is the first one at the scene saying it's not it's not a fully engulfed it's just a wastebasket fire or something so now we can we can you know slow down or whatever, but it, it helps a lot when, when somebody when you can hear from somebody else and they can back. Same thing with us. If we were in a big accident and we could tell the police what we have and stuff, so they can know who to send and you know you know and everything else. So that's that's what makes it so much you know critical. Can I tell one radio story? I just it, one that ju I just thought of. One you reminded me of something. Um, I remember it was CVS. CVS. It was a CVS. It was an armed robbery. It was a takeover robbery. So three armed assailants went into the store. They hopped at the, the, the back counter at the pharmacy, stole pills, and ran out. So it came in as a robbery in progress to us. 
and we had a description, and we didn't know if they had left the store yet. So the description was given out, so we had patrols. I was a sergeant on day shift. Patrols were searching the perimeter area in their cruisers to see if they saw the vehicle. Myself and Officer McGinnis, and he was a detective at the time, Detective McGinnis, ended up at the front door of the store. And what we did is a cursory search. We did a search of the building. I had my AR-15, my patrol rifle, and also Detective McGinnis was there armed. And we did a search of the building. I mean, obviously, the people in the store were very shaken up. Uh, we found out, thank goodness, the assailants had fled the scene and left. But once I had cleared the store, I was still in the store. And I remember, I, this always stuck with me. I, I went to go clear in the radio. Everything's okay, 10-4, da-da-da, nothing. Several times I did that. I had to walk outside the building and clear myself from an armed robbery call. And I've never forgotten that. And if you can just put yourself into a police officer's shoes, right. you know, what if it had gone down in that store? What if I had come across the assailants? Yeah, what if they're still in there? All right. Now and and that, that would have been deadly. And, yeah. and that's, that's a story I'll always remember when it comes to radio issues. And since then, there's been hundreds. And, and I, have to, I have to say something about Dave Fosher and uh, Joey Milos. <laughs> They've been picking away at that system for years, piece by piece by piece, because they only have so much money and certain equipment right. to work with. Yeah. And, and it's time. It's time. It, it really, it, it's in my opinion beyond time and, and this is, um, you know, one of the other benefits of this timing, despite the fact that we are uh, in a pandemic, um, because the town of Shrewsbury has a AAA bond rating uh, and because the bond markets are incredible right now, uh, you know, the expected financing on this project would come in at 1.9%. Uh, and just think about that. Think if you could, you know, refinance your own house at 1.9% right now, would you go do that? And so, you know, the 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 timing of this is important not just because the need is so high but because there's a favorable condition in the bond market and so you know that means savings to taxpayers because you know we're not going to have to be paying as high of an interest rate and um, you know like our other debt exclusions in town this is over done over 20 years your highest year is your first year and then it continues to decline after that and so you know we I, I, in the last uh, 10 to 12 years we've done a very good job at uh, doing what we need to do to our municipal buildings and and we've leveraged other funds wherever possible uh, and we were able to do that for both Sherwood and Beale uh, to the MSBA and also for the library to the library um, state fund. Uh, police stations don't have uh, a fund to go to at the state in order to get some some grant funding uh, to assist and so you know this is on us as a community to fund and to pay for. And so part of when you do a project like this, you wanna make sure you're doing it as advantageously as possible for the taxpayers. And I, I don't think we would ever find uh, a better market for us to go out uh, and have to pay for this over a 20 year period of time. So, um, you know, I, I know that the, the firefighters and the police officers are uh, very grateful for uh, your leadership uh, being on the Community Supporters for Public Safety. You know, our, our job is to really make sure that people are well aware of the question that's coming and, and why it's very important for the community. And I think hearing today some of uh, your stories relative to the radio system and certainly the changing uh, in policing, as well as the fact that we have uh, a building which has huge infrastructure uh, and system challenges and deficiencies. Well, also, isn't Shrewsbury was ranked one of the best towns to live in in the state? So it wouldn't it be nice to be able to, if you if to have the best town, you should have the best equipment, you know, to, to make it make it a better community. So I mean, it's that's kind of a you know. Well, and I think we've also illustrated well in this community that we are very fiscally responsible. We take care of the investments we make. We have uh, buildings. Uh, I always use Floral Street School, which has now I think been open 22, 23 years. When you pull up to it, you might think the building opened yesterday. Uh, we take incredibly good care of our buildings, um, but the reality is you know, all buildings have a useful life and the police station has come to the end of its useful life. It doesn't make sense to attempt to add on to it. Uh, and, and because of the, the way it's uh, built, uh, it doesn't make sense to, from a financial perspective, to try and do that either. Um, but I think it is time for us to make this investment in our community. And um, I, I think that folks are uh, really engaged in what this is about and wanting to learn more. And I think that your insights today Having served in the two professions, uh, most uh, distinctly impacted, uh, certainly by the new building, but also by the radio system, really will help people understand uh, why it's so critical uh, that we vote yes uh, in November on this question. So I want to thank both of you, uh, not only for being part of this uh, effort to get this question passed, but more importantly, for your service uh, to this community. 
55 years between the two of you is quite a legacy in terms of public service. Thanks so much. Yeah. I'm very happy to see you with both your glowing smiles here, uh, being retired. I've lived here 62 years. I love this town. I just, I've been here, I was a paper boy. I just, to see it grow and to be able to work for this town and to protect the people in this town was, was an honor for me. And same for Chuck. I mean, we've always done our job 110% and stuff and it's, 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 you know, glad we both got to retire to see it too, you know. Nicely put. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen, and thank you. thank you for joining us here today on Conversations with Hannah. I hope you mo learned more both about the upcoming election in terms of uh, your different choices in terms of safely voting, as well as the importance of uh, question three, which will be on the presidential election ballot, uh, which will be to uh, build a new police station and to replace our existing emergency communication system, which is 25 years old, uh, with a new one, which will be uh, built uh, not only for today, but for future use uh, in this town to expand as well. So thank you all.